Hello, how are you? Finally, I'm getting around to follow up Cinematic Tools tutorials. Tools? What are tools? Uh, I don't know. It's been a while since the last, but I've been kind of busy and I wanted to consider exactly how to present this final video or videos, given that within the Environments tab, there really is an awful lot to cover. So, this is part one of the Environments tab. In this video, we'll have a quick overview of the new controls layout and mess about with some depth of field and color correction. Today, we're on Dragon Pass, not the most popular map to play on, admittedly, but it's quite fun to modify. The environmental controls themselves have been modified recently. We've still got open and save for preset management and all the tabs and various settings are where they were, but the way that those settings are applied has changed slightly. When you first load into a map, you'll notice that the fields for each tab are essentially zeroed and untouched. In order to retrieve the existing environmental settings for that map, we click Get Values, and the tools then set about looking up and populating all the existing environmental settings for the currently loaded map. You can now alter those values as required, but the changes won't be applied to your client until you tick the relevant override box on the control page. What this means is that you can make alterations to various aspects of the environment and override them individually as you see fit. So let's say I'm doing a night map and I've turned off outdoor lighting and changed the sun position and color, but I want to be able to see what I'm doing momentarily. Rather than having to change those settings back to be able to see, I can simply deselect the outdoor light override and it will revert to standard map settings. That's particularly handy if you're making big depth of field or fog changes, for example, something that otherwise obstructs your view of the map, you can quickly turn that on or off from the controls page. Let's look at that in practice then. Uh, fog settings are quite obvious, so uh, let's enable color, change it to something uh, pink and ridiculous and increase the curve. Uh, all across the board there. That'll do. Uh, obviously, you're not seeing that in the game window. It will only be applied to your current environment when you click the override tab. And here we have some delightfully pink hills, which uh, look deeply impressive. I think you'll agree. Good. As, uh, as delightful as they are, are, I'm just going to remove those for now and let's enable color correction and take a look at, at that. This is actually one of the more straightforward things to play with, but it can have a significant impact on the overall feel of the map. By default, you'll see that the enable box is not ticked, so that's the first thing you'll need to do. If you're familiar with color in Photoshop or any other image editor, this will be immediately apparent. RGB, of course, stands for red, green and blue. We have three main controls over each color channel for any map, brightness, contrast, and saturation. You can either make alterations to each RGB channel individually or grade the image by using the color picker on the right. But this tends to be quite a heavy handed approach if you're not careful with it. Whilst this looks like an easy way to create a night environment, say if I uh, go blue, Remember that it colors everything, including, for example, your what once was white torchlight. And given that we've essentially removed most of the red from the image, something like a laser sight attachment will now become all but invisible. And you can just about see it there, but if I disable that, you'll see it makes it uh, significantly harder to, to see. So my advice with this tab is to be subtle and alter each value separately to get the desired look. Experimentation is certainly uh, the best way to get to learn this effect. So let's uh, disable the UI. UI dot draw enable. And I think I'll go to free camera, uh, 10.1 and a bit of perspective. This is quite a yellow map, so uh, we might want to reduce some of the red. Uh, enable that, whoops. 
and saturation just a little bit really only small adjustments to the numbers uh, will have a, a significant impact and perhaps just up the blue there a little bit I just play around with it uh, I might want a little bit more contrast perhaps uh, more of a filmic look I don't know you know it's personal preference and uh, you'll be wanting to tailor the image to you know whatever kind of effect you're after to suit the mood of your picture or your uh, cinematic okay let's uh, disable that and now have a look at depth of field uh, depth of field again is an effect that is very easily overused. I've certainly been accused of it in the past, uh, being quite heavy handed with it. So I'm always mindful that when I apply this effect now in a picture or a film that it looks as natural as possible. The key really is applying a smooth graduation from something in focus to something out of focus. So depth of field, let's um, narrow our field of view a bit for this to make it more apparent what's actually happening. Uh, we've got some items here that are close to the camera and some foliage and hills and stuff far away from the camera. Uh, just to help illustrate the point. Now when you first look at this tab, if you're not familiar with it, um, there are a lot of boxes, a lot of fields with a lot of numbers, but um, really we're only going to be using a few of those. Uh, it's best to start perhaps by changing max blur to one Let's enable that so you can see what's going on. That's probably the most blur you'd want to have in a depth of field effect. You can obviously go uh, crazy with it, but it it won't look like a natural camera. Uh, focus distance, if I push that away from the camera, you can see that as standard, the line delineating the bit that's in focus and that that is not is quite severe and it looks uh, quite abrupt and very unnatural. So we're going to want to smooth that graduation so that the further away from the camera you get, the more blurred it gets, but in a smooth gradient. So uh, blur factor, that's one normally blur add. You don't need to that. This just adds blur across the whole, uh, the whole frame. That's the effect that's applied in the menu, say, for the background. They just blur up uh, the background across the board there. So uh, back to zero, Gaussian, we can leave that at nine. Uh, sprites, this changes the type of depth of field effect. There's a simple effect which doesn't look as good, but it's quicker to render and doesn't have such an impact on performance. So you'll probably want to leave that on sprite. Uh, scroll sensitivity, this is re uh, with regard to focusing with a mouse scroll wheel, enables you to focus the camera on the fly, which is quite useful perhaps for certain cinematic situations where you want to change focal point from one to another. Uh, as if you're rotating the focal ring on a lens, say, uh, but it's quite difficult to get the hang of. You need to be quite precise with it. This is the box for uh, blur in the distance. Iron sight's depth of field relates to uh, the depth of field effect close to the camera. So if I push this away here, uh, you should start to see things closer to the camera becoming blurry. But I'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, Iron sight, depth of field, circular blur. You don't need to use that probably. Uh, focus with scroll wheel we've talked about. I'm just basically going to try and cover the things that you'll find practically of use. Now, near start, near end, you can probably leave. Uh, this is all, this section here all relates to Iron sight, depth of field. And this is, uh, this is a box we're probably going to want to use. So far end, this point here is the distance from the camera at which the blur will become its most prominent. So this is the maximum blur point distance from the camera. So let's push that back out to 200. You can see that stuff locked closer to the camera is now in focus. Uh, even though our focus distance is quite close, the further I reduce that number, the closer it will come. But you can see now that Items like this wheelbarrow uh, and this water pump, if 
I just push it a bit further out. They're in focus, then this rock and some shrubbery here, slightly out of focus and towards the distance uh, we've reached our max blur effect, in fact 200 units from the camera. It's max blur, we'll change that, maybe increase that so you can see it a bit more. Um, I'll push that out so we've got a little bit of blur on the boxes behind the wheel there and gradually as you get further from the camera depth of field effect increases. So you're going to want to adjust this to taste uh, depending on the type of shot that you're creating you're going to want to increase or decrease the amount of blur but hopefully that gives you a rough idea of uh, the numbers that you might need to change. Fast start that has a similar effect to focal distance they're kind of a kind of a blend of both to achieve the right effect but difficult to describe but uh, you can almost leave that at zero and depending on how close you want the camera or how close the, you want the blur to be to the camera in fact let me say again depending on how gradual you want the gradation from in focus to out of focus to be uh, depends very much on this number so if I want a very smooth graduation I might change this to 1000 and then I could reduce that either the far start or reduce the focal distance and pull that in a bit and then we've got a very smooth graduation from things that are in focus to those that are out of focus if I was very close to the subject that I wanted to be in focus uh, this guy for example I could probably pull that in to 20 and I'd have to push the focus distance out again but that would that would not look too bad. I might actually uh, just stop him wobbling around a bit. Just freeze that. So um, if you're talking about things that are closer to the camera, you can afford to have more of the depth of field effect. Uh, that's just the way lenses work. So let's bring that in a bit. And the near end, uh, so the far end could be maybe 10. And if we push the distance out a bit, you can see we're just focusing on the gun really, and everything past the soldier is now out of focus. Let's have a look at the reverse of that. Let's turn off depth of field far and turn on iron sights depth of field. And this is the depth of field close to the camera. So you can see again, this is going to be. Uh, going to be a gradient that's required whereby you don't want that line so out of focus in focus you want it to gradiate more as you get away from the camera so we'll pull this back to perhaps minus 10 or something and push out the focal distance and it's a much smoother gradient so the barrel we can have out of focus let's maybe bring that in a little bit more Oops. one maybe so the barrel is a bit out of focus I might even make that minus two to increase the effect close to the camera and then mix that with far depth of field and I'll turn off freeze as well Hopefully you can see the kind of effect we're going for. Uh, that's it for now, guys. Uh, that video has probably been long enough already. And uh, we'll move on to some of the other tabs uh, in the next video. I'll catch you later.